Good evening from Vietnam, Paul. Good morning from your time. Actually, it's good afternoon. Good afternoon to from your time, right? Almost, almost. It's it's almost. still morning here, but uh, hello. It's good to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining the Inside Sharing Show. As I shared with you earlier, Paul, uh, our country got hit badly by COVID last year, and uh, um, we run the program with the hope to inject motivation, inspirations for the people, and uh, have them be able to hear good stories so they that they can learn from uh, the experts and uh, instead of wasting the time on negative uh, news. Uh, so with that being said, thank you so much for spending your time with us, the audience here in Vietnam. All right. Thank you. It's uh, it, it, it's mind blowing to to be able to be part of this. So thank you. <laughs> hey, Paul, I, I've been running this, this program with over 200 people uh, over the past nine months, and uh, we always bring our speaker all the way back to when they first started their career and when they were in university. So we would want to hear your story, Paul. What, you know, what did you study and how the whole career journey moved? Um, I think I would be described as someone who blossomed late um, at school. Um, I was more into sport and that kind of thing. So my academics didn't really take off until I got to college. Um, but I studied, I started by studying business and finance primarily because I really didn't know what I need, wanted to do. Um, I didn't want to go into my father's business um, and, and become part of that. I wanted to be my own person uh, and he was okay with that. So I I had lots of conversations and they said, well, do business. if you don't know, do business and finance. That will always stand you in good good stead. Go learn about mm -hmm. money, go learn how about business works. So I did that. And because my academic work at school wasn't particularly good, all of a sudden I start getting getting A grades. And I'm like, I'm like a little puppy. You know, if you, if you give a puppy a treat, it'll say, well, that's great. I'll have more of that, please. And I loved, I loved business and finance and I particularly loved marketing. So I followed all the marketing courses to really understand buyer behavior and market research and marketing communications. Um, and that, that sort of took me on the, on the path of where I went to in my early career. So my, my career goes in sort of like three parts, I would say. So the first part was first part was marketing. So I went to University of Manchester. I studied management sciences and I specialized in marketing. Um, really, really wanting to get in. It seemed like a very glamorous and exciting world of you know, working with all these brands and we're doing great communication and you know, learning how people buy is really interesting. You know, I remember standing in a supermarket watching watching um, a young lady pick soup and how she actually paused and you know went went across the shelf and i still remember that vividly and it was a very long time ago um i just found all that fascinating um mm. so i started to wear a suit so I, I graduated from college and i started to wear a suit and learned how to wear that in a software house um mm. i liked technology uh, if you see my setup here there's 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 more technology than you can shake a stick at um and I liked the idea of that. So we were, um, so digital equipment used to exist in those days. Um, and we we were a reseller of digital equipment computers and we sold mm -hmm. software for logistics. So um, all about warehousing and distribution of goods and managing stock and inventory and all that side. But there was also a peripherals division that sold the latest technology. So whether it was Apollo workstations or whether it's certain range of printers or PCs or laptops that were just coming through and Apple computers. And, and I, I just became a big Apple fan. I, I love I love working with Apple. Uh, we were also unusually a, a, a dealer for IBM and we IBM had a, a, a system, System 88, which was a, one of the first uh, large scale fault tolerant uh, systems. So they had sort of uh, parallel capabilities inside the box. So if one part it had resilience built into it, basically. So I learned to do that and uh, then decided that whilst that was fun, it wasn't really a big brand and I wanted to get some big brand experience. So I managed to persuade Barclays to give me a job in the marketing department. Uh, mm. And I worked in the direct loans division, learning how to sell uh, loans to consumers through the post. Mm. Uh, through what the was post. Interesting through the post, yes, it was it was mail order, the very early yeah. mail order. I'll, t I'll tell you how early it was. 
we used to when we used to figure out how many pieces of mail we would send out we would we would send an instruction via and so we've got a secretary in the pool to type the instruction to send in the internal mail to the computer center in northampton to create a program to say please count how many people we can target this month mm. and then they'd send a printout back which was a green you remember the pre printer paper that was sort of like green and white stripes we get all the data back on that um mm. and it would tell us how many people we could target that month and then we sent another memo back saying great let's do that uh, yeah. So it was it was it was way before client server. It was way before Google and the Internet. So that's how old I am. Uh, but but what that helped me do was it really put me at the forefront of what we might know as database marketing or data driven marketing. So I learned how to make money from data, mm -hmm. which was extremely valuable to clients because everyone was getting into this thing of, well, we're selling direct to clients. We're getting all this data. How do we how do we do stuff? So I'd run big campaigns for the likes of Next Directory, which is a fashion retail group here, and we mm. we'd do that. We'd uh, run campaigns for BT was one of my clients, um, Dixon Store Group, which was a huge electrical re retailer um, that no longer exists. Um, it sort of morphed into different things as various acquisitions happened. Um, and I was unusual because I had one foot in the technology camp, but I also had mm. one foot in the. So I can design an entity relationship diagram. You know, I'm quite happy mm. designing a logical database diagram and giving it to programmers. So go build that. And marketeers look at me as though I have two heads, and technolo te technologists look at me and going, "How do you know how to do that?" Um, <laughs> so um, I then moved to Equifax. Um, Equifax gave me the opportunity to work with a whole range of other clients. Uh, I started working internationally, so we worked. And, and once you go to the US, you're dealing with a different scale of consumers. You know, you know, two thousand stores is is nothing. So we worked with Home Depot. We were working with. By then, we were starting to work with Unix systems and particularly massive mm. parallel processing systems. So we'd work with the Starfire service that, that Sun used to build. That was great kit and we put oracle on it and and we do we'd have this proprietary software that would do things that standard pieces of software couldn't do uh, and and consequently we learned a lot about how to it, how to use things like recency frequency value analysis um, for consumer brands to actually make money we won we won a national award as we went along uh, in that process which was great um, and eventually uh, so during my time at Equifax, I was extremely lucky. I got sponsored to go to Henley Business School, now part of the University of Reading. And I did my MBA there, which I absolutely loved. Um, we got uh, we got time to uh, travel abroad. So I chose to go to China because I thought, well, it's not often that you get an opportunity like that. So I, I spent time in Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou. Um, we stayed on and we went to Xi'an to see the terracotta army and all that and, and really immerse ourselves in. And it was just fascinating. Uh, and as someone who now does martial arts, I did Tai Chi at the time we did that. So one of my one of my ambitions was to get up in the morning at five o'clock in the morning and join every everyone in, of the locals who were in the park doing all their morning exercises from mm -hmm. dancing and swords and Tai Chi. And it was it was brilliant because because I'm six foot two and I'm white and I know I don't look like anyone that's in the park. So constantly, <laughs> every, every, everyone was looking at me uh, and I was trying to I was trying to find people that were doing what I knew, which was the Chen Manching style of Tai Chi. And I found a group and it was led by a guy. I swear he was 90 years old. He was about five foot and 90 years old. And I sort of made hand signals that were basically saying, please, can I join you? And he, he said, yeah, come, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we were doing that. So I, I got to do that at half past five in the morning. And there's certain moves that you know require you to move in certain ways. And this guy was clearly had been doing it all his life because he was just amazing. I couldn't get anywhere near him. It was he was phenomenal. Mm. So I, I spent time in China, which was brilliant. Got my MBA. That two days after completing my finals for my MBA, I walked into PwC, uh, Surprise Waterhouse Coopers to go and become a management consultant. Mm -hmm. I then had a 20 year career as a management consultant. So when I joined PwC, I kind of left pure marketing behind and went into management consultancy. 
But I was looking at CRM then, what everyone calls CRM. People, you know, people get very confused about what CRM is and what it isn't. They're still confused, amazingly enough. Um, mm. And I spent time working with Nestle, with Diageo, with Samsung, uh, with um, who else did I work with? Uh, some of the public sector, mm. helping them understand how to do data governance, how to streamline their data how to unify onto a single platform of technology instead of having 26 different platforms that were costing them a load of money um, and yeah. how to rationalize uh you know some of their choices around you know well we've got 20 agencies well why do you need 20 agencies uh so rationalizing that saving lots of money um to do that and, and essentially showing them how to how to how to make money from data there was a day i, I I was in the UK. I done some consulting, and don't get me wrong, consulting at that time in my life was was awesome. Yeah, you know, I turned left on every plane. I, mm. you know, I'd be in Connecticut one day. I'd fly overnight. We'd do something in London. Then I get back on a plane. We go to Paris. You know, I'd, I'd feel like a king. I'd be a very, <laughs> tired, I'd be a very tired king. But but I, it, it felt great. But then come, there comes a point where it catches up with you, and you go, oh, is, is this really what the rest of my life is all about? Mm. I remember sitting in a hotel in London. It was a Hilton Hotel on Edgware Road, looking at the wall after a hard day's consulting, going, is, is this it? Why do I feel like this? I, I shouldn't. You know, mm. I've, got a, I've got a great salary. I've got a job with a fantastic company. Uh, I've got a nice car, a nice house. You know, I go on big holidays. Why do I feel miserable? And mm. most people looking from the outside in would probably go, get over yourself. What, are, what is with you? You've got everything. Mm. Uh, and I had to explore it. And that evening, on I picked up the, the Evening Standard, which is the local evening newspaper. And in there, there was an, a small advert in the corner of a page that said, get the life you deserve. Two hours, free seminar. And I went, that sounds like me. I, I need that. So sure enough, I went along and I learned two very valuable lessons. First of all, there's no such thing as a free seminar. Um, mm. there's, there's always some upsell. <laughs> um, which, which I did. And second of all, I discovered neuro-linguistic programming, which was my way into psychology. Uh, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the feeling of some of the, the healing and some of the things that I learned about myself through going through that process. But more than anything, I loved seeing this work and the impact it had on other people. Um, mm. And, and it's, it, it became the start point of why I got into coaching. What years was that? 2007. 2007? Yeah. So about 15 years ago. Yeah, I've been doing this for 15 years now. So, um, and, and what's been interesting is um, there's an expression that says there's me search in research. So every time I do something, I, I always learn something about myself as much as learning about my clients. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I didn't know that. And, mm. and what, 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 I, what I love is is how complex and beautiful we are as human beings and and we forget that you know particularly in the last two years it's been extremely difficult we've all been in the same storm but the truth is we're all in different boats you know i've worked with some of the frontline health staff in emergency wards who are dealing mm. with very very difficult situations and um uh, some of our best friends one of my best friends is a celebrant so doing funerals and all that kind of thing and just hearing the stories that are, that are harrowing. So I know, um, I, I know for a lot of people, it, it has been extremely difficult. But it's given us time to pause and to really think about our relationship to ourselves, mm. our relationship to each other and our relationship to the world outside us. Mm. And it's, I think it's given us, I think when we get to, when we all get to a point where we can breathe and we're, not, we're nowhere near that yet, then I think we will look back and perhaps see that it was a turning point for us as a human race, as a human species, um, mm. where, wherever you are. And I, I find that inspiring. So I am endlessly curious about about that. So, so that took me on a journey. I started coaching. I was working with clients. And some of the tools and techniques I was using weren't working. And what mm. bothered me was the people who supervised me would say, oh, well, that's your client's fault. You know, it's, it's your client. And I'd be like, really? I'm not sure that's true. I'm mm. not sure that it's either something I'm not doing. So I went on a, 
uh, what I consider is an endless uh, endless journey of learning, uh, which mm. I love. Um, so you'll see behind me a whole bunch of books, and I've got yeah. two. Uh, I've, I've got two and a half thousand papers um, that I've gathered over the years and read to sort of build my knowledge and understanding. And what I think I do well is I connect dots and I go, oh, okay, so that there, if I put that there and put them together, I've got something. And it's interesting because if you um, there's um there's a thing called the coaching psychology pod, and I was listening to the it's new. And I was listening to an episode last night that was saying, does coaching work? And it, and it was great because we were saying it's, well, it's all about the integrated approach and there's lots of inputs and there's lots of outputs and it depends what the goal is. And you know, the answer is a standard consulting answer, which is it depends. Um, <laughs> you know, yes. you know, that, there's, there's the very old joke, which is, which is all about, you know, how many, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has got to want to change. Um, and that is that is still very true. Um, so I I studied energy psychology. So uh, and what that did was it bring it brought a lot of Eastern philosophy and Eastern practice into things like meridians and acupuncture and understanding pressure points and energy points. And you go, oh yeah, that starts to make sense. So I use tapping as a, mm -hmm. a non invasive approach to to acupuncture to help shift um, energy within the body. That that. A lot of Eastern cultures know um, because they grow up with it, um, mm. but in the West we don't. We we assume that the mind is something that sits inside the head, and it isn't. It's the flow of energy and information inside us and between us. And, mm. and one of the things I'm trying to do is is bring that message to say, you know, you need to think of mind differently. You you also need to think of mental health differently. Mm. Um, so. Um, that became important. Then I wanted to learn about psychotherapy because I went down the route of I'll become a psychotherapist then. And I was very lucky. I got to study a course called contemporary psychotherapy. And that what that does is it allowed me to compare and contrast all the major modalities. So mm -hmm. here's psychodynamic, here's CBT, here's gestalt, here's solution focused, here's humanistic, and here's systemic neurolinguistic programming. So what are the strengths of this? What are the weaknesses? How are they similar? Um, what's different about existential psychotherapy versus you know, a solution based? And that really puts you in the middle of, of being able to, what I describe as dance in the moment. That's mm. just, oh, I, I can translate that. That sounds like this, right? I've got a tool in my bag that comes from Gestalt. Right, let's use that. Or I've got a tool in my bag that says, right, let's examine how you construct that thought. Um, in in terms of you know what's the hierarchy of thinking? Let's draw that on a piece of paper, and that comes out of CBT, and that and, and that's just that's just wonderful to, mm. to to be able to have that flexibility to do that. And I'm not saying I know everything. I don't. You know, nobody knows anything. In fact, the more you know, the less you know. That that's yeah. that, that's very very true. Um, so I'd gone through psychotherapy, and I came out of that going, I can't make that work. Mm. One of the reasons I do what I do is to help young men who got in a mess. Mm. I was one of those young men. I, <laughs> I when I, you were young, right? Yeah, I, I made a lot of silly mistakes growing up and I was lucky that I, it wasn't drugs. I was lucky that it wasn't alcohol, but it was finance for me. So I spent a lot of money on things I didn't need that I thought would make me feel better. I put it all on credit cards and loans, and sure enough, I had I built a big personal debt, um, about about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars by the time I got to the end of it, and it it put me in a place that kind of trapped me, you know. Um, very, uh, you know, it it would make a soap soap opera, you know, on TV. It would make a great TV drama, um, but that was then. I think the thing I learned was resilience. I learned how to get through that. And it took me nine years and nine months to pay that off. And I did. I could have gone bankrupt, but I took the harder route. And that has been such a gift for me because you 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 accumulate so many stories about moments of resilience. Uh, you learn what resilience is, what, what it really is. You learn why you did what you did. And you kind of go, OK, yeah, I, I get all that now. How can I help other people avoid that? How can I take my lessons and do that? So I do the coaching uh, to support you know, to support my family first, 
Um, mm. But then also with whatever is left over to, to look at how can I work with young men, excuse me, and to guide them and support them so that they think about the choices they make. Mm. It's, not, it's not to tell them what to do. It's just to go, OK, so you're going to do that. Um, what do you think the consequences of that are? Mm. When you look 12 months from now, how will you feel about making that decision? And it's treating them as as grown up, as young adults. And I don't think I don't think our society does that enough. So it's it's my small way of making a contribution. Wow. So um, so yeah, I've um, so in two thousand and twelve, I was made redundant. Uh, I decided to be a professional musician. I still play with music. <laughs> And I had a great. Oh, you said you love music since you were three years old, right? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, my first piano lesson was when I was three, uh, um, and, and then I went down the classical music route. And at thirteen, I discovered Deep Purple and guitars, and I thought, no, that's way cooler than classical music. I want to do that. <laughs> now I like to do both. So I've got three guitars here, two keyboards, and I'm learning to write for orchestra. So you know, that's 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 something that fills me up. Mm. Uh, so now, uh, so that was 2012. In 2019, I was made redundant again. I got the opportunity to say, right, I'm going to build my own business now. I'm going to take what I was doing as a side hustle, for want of a term. Mm -hmm. okay, no, I, I want to do this full time because I love it. I absolutely love what I do. It's, it's, it's a real privilege um, to be able to help individuals and witness them move from a place where they thought they couldn't do something mm. to a place where they actually can and they're really good at it and you wow. kind of go that's awesome mm. and it's within all of us you know i i'm so i'm thinking about leadership so in 2019 forbes reported that uh, we invested globally 366 billion dollars in leadership development yes to which my 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 response is and look where we are. Mm. If we're spending that money on leadership development. We should not be in some of the mess that we're in globally. Mm. And, it, and yeah, it's fun to talk about bad leaders. You know, we like talking about bad leaders and all they're bad, but um, that isn't the point. I want to look at where is the disconnect happening and why is there a disconnect? What is it that's causing that? And how do we do that differently? So when I was at IBM, I worked for IBM in two stints. Um, I did 13 years overall. The last stint was eight years. And I was lucky enough to be invited to teach what a lot of people would recognize as soft skills. I prefer to call them as power skills because there's nothing soft about compassion, not real mm. compassion. There's nothing mm. soft about being humble. There's nothing soft about having empathy with someone and, mm. and standing in the fire with, alongside them without and resisting all all um, temptation to try and fix it, you know, it, it, helping them just be there. I mean, that takes an immense amount of um, humility and courage to do that. And I developed, I, I used to, I used to teach um, emotional intelligence to consultants and, you know, consultants, we like two by two boxes and we like flip charts. You can see I've got a flip chart behind me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be anywhere else without one. Um, mm. And we'd say, this is emotional intelligence. We draw it on a flip chart, two by two, explain it. And then people would go off and do a, a role play. They come back and they go, so what questions do you have? How was that? And there'd be no questions. And you go, so everyone knows emotional intelligence. Let's go to lunch. And, and the truth is emotional intelligence, like, like mastering a martial art, is a lifetime's journey to yeah. go from being a white belt to, you know, someone that never gets to where full mastery, but is further down the road. So I thought about that and I thought that, and very often I will, if I'm running a webinar, I'll say, okay, show me how you do emotional intelligence. How do you do it? And it goes very, very quiet because people sort of start looking around and, and yeah. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I do it, but I don't know what I do. And I go, good. And I develop what I call the grace framework. Um, and the grace what is that grace framework then? I actually intended to ask you about the grace framework too. So. So the grace framework is is my take. So it doesn't mean it's it's right, but it's my take on how we do emotional intelligence. And it's 
a mnemonic. It's a way of remembering key things. And what's different about it is it engages the body. So the G of grace is for grounding. Mm. Now, the grace framework isn't prescriptive. It doesn't say, if you do this, you'll be successful and brilliant. What it says is, here's things that are helpful, that science, it's, so it's, you know, it's science informed, mm. that, that help you be better at regulating. It helps you understand that. So the assumption in, in emotional intelligence is we self-regulate. We don't. Mm. We co-regulate first. So you and I are having a conversation and mm. we are reading unconsciously and consciously all the signals, even through video medium yeah. Yeah, that we are reading. And we are co-creating this conversation, which is an experience. Mm. So you have to understand that first, because until you co-regulate and you feel safe, so bringing out polyvagal theory, um, then you won't relax into a conversation. And once you feel safe, so you know all this stuff people talk about psychological safety. Mm. Yeah, we know what it is, but how do you do it? And it's by building a conversation that has tiny moments of trust within it that that you read consciously and unconsciously and go, oh, I, I actually feel safe. This person isn't going to harm me. This person isn't going to do something that makes me feel unsafe, that makes me feel shame. Mm. There, there are, um, one of the people I listen to is Dr. Pippa Grange, and she talks about there's only two fears in the world. There's fear in the moment. So I'm swimming in the sea and there's a big shark behind me and it's about to bite my legs off. That's mm. fear in the moment. Or I'm standing on a tall tower and I'm about to fall off. That's fear in the moment. So we've got this fear in the moment thing. Perfectly natural. It's what we're supposed to do. All other fears we can put in a bucket that we call fear of not being enough. Mm. What's her name? So her name is Dr. Pippa Grange. Okay. Uh, she's a sports psychologist mm -hmm. uh, and a very good one. Um, and I, I think that's I think that's interesting. So you need to feel safe. So grounding allows you to do that. And you need to. So and there's many ways to do that. What we're essentially doing is we're we're build we're doing activities that increase the strength and tone of our vagus nerve. And our okay. vagus nerve is what controls how we respond. It controls the activation of our fight right, flight response. It controls our freeze, our fawn, our feign, and our faint um, okay. response. So the stronger that is, then when we face a situation that's not comfortable, we can stand in our ground and breathe. I always laugh at clients because they go, have you, have you got a quick win? Can, can you help me? I feel really stressed and I need something. And I go, breathe. Oh, I, haven't got time to, I haven't got time to do that. I can't take 10 minutes out and breathe. And it's kind of like, man, here's why you need to do it. And it's so simple. Just learn to breathe, inflate your belly, deflate your belly. Oh, I can't do that. People will see me and I look fat and uh, all these excuses come up. And you go, okay, then your stress isn't painful enough. Because if yes. it was painful enough, you'd just do it. So things like yoga, things like Tai Chi, things like swimming, uh, anything that changes the biochemistry within our bodies and, and increases vagal tone is grounding. So, for example, there's a, there's a real simple exercise you can do, which is take your shoes off, go outside, stand on grass for mm -hmm. 10 minutes. What the stand heck? on grass on the barefoot then? Yep. Yeah. That is grounding. It's actually earthing. And it earths you because it take what it does is it helps th take the charge that's built up in the day in our mm. electrical system, our internal elect electrical system, mm. and to discharge it into the ground. What that does is it thins the red blood cells. Our red blood cells flow, flow faster and more easily around our body, transporting oxygen to where it's needed more efficiently, and therefore mm. we feel better. Mm. So if you stand on the grass for ten minutes. Pick an exercise you like, like cycling, running, Tai Chi, swimming, whatever. And then you do 10 minutes of mindful meditation twice a day. Actually, you're going to be in great shape for the, for the grounding piece. But, it, but it's not just about grounding. Okay. R is for resolve. 
we are obsessed in our society with smart goal setting. We are obsessed with outcome. You know, when I get this, I can buy a new house. When I achieve this, I can have my bonus. Yeah? yeah. What we need to fall in love with is the process. Because the truth is we don't have any control over the outcome. We we like to think so. And I know a lot of people who may listen to this may go, you're talking rubbish. But it's true. We have no control over the outcome. It's 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 we can stack the cards in our favor. So if I'm going to run a hundred meter sprint against Usain Bolt and I just sit on the sofa and I eat potato chips and I don't exercise and I don't do anything. And then I start on the front on the hundred meter line next to Usain Bolt. Am I going to do well? No, I'm not. But if I sit down with Usain and I say, young man, you're the fastest athlete in the world. Tell me what you do and how you do it. How do you prepare for that? What's your process? And if I copy his process, when I turn up to race him, I will still lose because mm -hmm. he's the fastest man. Will I run 10 times faster than I previously could? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the idea of resolve is, is not to say don't have goals. It's to say don't start there. It's to set an intention. An intention has all kinds of scientific evidence behind it that says it's more effective because once you have intention, that's where your attention goes. So I'll give you an example. I took uh, I took up martial arts again um, four and a half years ago, and my intention was to get a black belt in Aikido. Mm. Part of that was my part of that my so I'm I'm in my mid fifties. You know, uh, I saw my parents. Uh, physically did you know when you watch old age happen and the physical consequences of that of not investing in your in your body i i just took a decision that said i i know i'm going to die but i want to be in really good shape when i do <laughs> physically because because I, I saw my parents suffer and, and i i didn't I, that hurt me and i didn't want to go through that mm. But when I rocked up to the dojo for the first time, it was all about, I want a black belt. I want to be able to say to people, hey, I've got a black belt in Aikido, aren't I great? My ego loves that. Um, two years in, it was very different. It was, yeah, I, I want a black belt because I still want to talk about that. But I actually want to talk more about who I became to get that. Mm. So I had to develop a process of training four times a week. I had to change my diet to be much more healthy instead of saying, oh, well, I exercise four times a week, therefore I can still eat hamburgers and I can drink wine and this, that and the other. Um, mm. So I became a healthier person. That activity gets me into my body. I've become mm. a peaceful person. Mm. I've become a person that's able to become more present. So when, when a seventh Dan Black Belt is standing across from you with a, bokken, with a wooden sword, and he's going to come after you all, all out. And even though it's practice, you know, you're shaking a bit when the first time mm. that happens. But to get to a point where you, where you can say, OK, bring it. Go on, then. Do it. Mm. And, and, and just to have that ability to be present and quiet. There's a favorite writer of mine called David White. And David White talks about presence. And he says the harvest of presence is beauty mm. and i i just think that is an exquisite thing to do because what you do is the more present you are the more you see the more you take in and in order to do that you have to be still you have to be still on the outside and you have to be still on the inside mm. so that's grounding and that's resolve now the goals you can still have goals that says right in two months time, I'm going to make I'm going to take a test that will give me my next tag that will take me towards my black belt. I may or I may not achieve that. What I'm going to focus on is not getting the tag, but the process of being in the best position I can be in when I take that test. Mm. The better I have prepared myself, the more likely I will pass the test. Mm. But there is no guarantee. So that's that. The A is for acceptance acceptance and acceptance falls into three areas it is acceptance of self mm. acceptance of other and acceptance of the system in which you're in mm. 
So when you make a judgment about someone, so I say, okay, what do you think about Donald Trump? And people jump, jump all over it and go, oh, I don't like Donald. He's, you know, he's this, he's that, he's the other, he's, he did this and he did that. He's a horrible man and he's this, that and the other. You're making a bunch of judgments. Mm. You are taking up space in your mind to something that you don't need to do. Where is your compassion? Where is your empathy and understanding? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not condoning anything he does. But I am prepared to stand back and say he's a human being. He's somebody's son. He's somebody's father. And he may be conditioned in such a way that causes him to choose to behave in a particular way that doesn't sit with my values. Mm. That's very different from turning around and pointing a finger and saying you're an and then whatever word you choose to use. Acceptance of other is, is, is really important, particularly in teams. And particularly as we talk about diversity and equity and inclusion and belonging oh. as a key part, you know, belonging is so underrated. Mm -hmm. you know, if I feel I belong, I will give you more. If I feel you've got my back, I will give you more. Mm -hmm. If you feel I've got your back, guess what? You'll give me more. Guess what happens? We co-regulate better. The height of our performance is related to the depth of our connection. Yeah. But that requires us to learn how to be vulnerable. And everybody's scared of this word because they think, oh, it's oversharing. You know, it's like, oh, I need to share certain things. And no, that's not it. That's not it at all. It's just that willingness to take it baby steps at a time towards that. So acceptance of other is a key. Mm. The last one is acceptance of self. So to everyone listening, I want to give you an exercise to go do. You'll think this is the craziest thing in the world, and that, but it isn't because I'll give you the science as to why it isn't. Next time you go into your bathroom or mm. wherever you have a mirror where you can see yourself, I want you to walk in and, and look in the mirror at yourself and smile. And then I want to give you, you to give yourself a high five. Actually, touch the mirror and touch, touch the hand that meets you. Okay. That is ex partly acceptance of self. You know, it's looking at the body and going, Okay, I'm going to stop complaining about my legs are too thin or my smile is too wide or my hair is funny or I can't wear hats or yeah, you know, I'm not a good I'm not good at this. No, just you you're not going to be good at everything. So just accept it. Mm. And the reason is, so there's a piece of research that says NBA basketball basketball teams in the US that touch each other mm. more frequently than NBA basketball teams that don't touch each other during a game, guess what? They win more. They win more, yeah. <laughs> so why wouldn't you do it? So what I find funny is we do all these things in sports and we do all these things in the elite military. And we go, look, it works. And I know they're very specialized circumstances, but why wouldn't you take those things and just assume, mm -hmm. well, we think our way through this. No, you can't. So that's, that's acceptance. C is for creativity. Oh. And, and, and one of the most scary things is to look at a blank piece of paper like this one mm. and say, I want you to write 200 words on joy or a topic. And they go, I've got a blank piece of I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm going to see how someone else has done it. And, and I'm going to copy that. And the mm. consultancies do this all the time. It's like, well, here we've got 100 case studies of work we've done before. Which, which would you like us to copy for you? Mm. I know I've done it. <laughs> but, but we live in a world. Uh, Einstein said, you know, the level of thinking that gets us out of the problems that we've now got is not the level of thinking that got us to here. Mm -hmm. If you're just going to copy what you did in the past, do you think you know, it's that expression? Doing the same thing and expecting a different result is mad. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something different, but it takes courage to do that because when we first create something for the first time, we usually fail and it sucks. Mm. And we don't like that feeling and mm. we don't like looking stupid. You know, we come back to acceptance. It's kind of like, OK, I'm going to fail. Now, in the technology industry, you know, this whole fail fast thing is is accepted and, and that's great. That's fine when we're task focused. But what about people focused? And yet when we stand back and we tell stories of, you know, who's our hero, um, what's the hardship we have, what's the highlight of our life, we will find commonality and we will all see that we're all the same.
Mm. If we study quantum mechanics and quantum physics, we know at a quantum level we're all connected anyway. Okay. And everyone goes, no, we're not. And you go, mm, have a look again. Uh, you, you think, and if we're all connected, then then what is it that causes us to do that? And if indigenous societies used to work as collectives and connections and collaborations and worked in harmony with nature and each other and got the kind of results that looked after the earth, then then why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? And a lot of it is our conditioning. A lot of it is we run on autopilot. A lot of it is we just don't take enough time to step back. And then the beauty of the pandemic, the only beauty of the pandemic is it's given us time to step back. Yep. And now we're all- Totally agree, yes. E is for embody. So there's a phrase, uh, a phrase that um, Dr. Brenny Brown uses, which is knowledge is rumor until it lives in the bones. So embody. Oh, embody it. So unless you embody, unless you walk your talk, unless you are practicing, unless you are reflecting on everything mm. else that's gone in front of you, then you're not embodying it. You're mm. you're playing not to lose instead of playing to win. Because it's a very mm. different energy. If you're playing if you're playing the game that says, I'll play the game, but part of me is going to stay back a little bit. I'm going to protect my turf. I'm going to make sure I don't look stupid. I make sure that I, I know all the answers and I'm seen to know all the answers and I have a title that that makes people feel impressed. That's OK. We all want titles to look mm. to look and feel good about ourselves and to be able to walk into a room and say, I'm this and I'm that. That's good. I understand it. it's perfectly human. It's when you use it in the wrong way. Mm. It's when you don't do that. So, you know, a lot of people are have a job that pays them an amount of money, but they're only doing half the job because half their energy is focused on protecting turf, not looking bad, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Perfectly natural, but there's a different way of doing it. You and I talked mm -hmm. earlier about, you know, we, we all drive a car with one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake at the same time. Mm. If we want to go faster, the assumption is that we press the accelerator harder. We forget that if we just take our foot off the brake a little, we'll go faster. Yeah. So if the brake is the playing not to lose thing, then stop playing not to lose. Have the have an have an uncommon conversation with people that says, look, we're just like each other. I can't mm. do this. I need your help. You're great at this. Would you help me? Mm. I feel really rubbish today, and I just need someone to pat me on the back and tell me I'm all right. Will you do that? Will you will you just make me feel? Will you will you tell me something about myself that will just pick me up? Mm. That takes that takes quite a bit of vulnerability to do that. But when you do it, when you when you're prepared to touch and look after each other, when you let people know they belong, and you're walking that talk and embodying it, then you put all that together. You're leading with grace, and wow. that's what the grace framework is about. Wow! Thank you so much. I think if and if 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 people can practice the grace framework. Not, at the, not even at the leadership level, but at, at everybody, if they can practice that, I think the world will be a, a whole lot better. Than well, here's here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. When I when I when I delivered the TEDx talk I did, and I was researching it, the thought came to me that everyone leads mm. in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's whether it's a mother feeding their family. Mm. Whether it's whether it's a father getting out of bed to apply for yet another job mm. because they're out of work, whether it's you know whoever it is, everyone leads, and we need to appreciate that. The other thing is everyone follows too. For we, all, we all lead and we all follow. Mm. And when we get you know maybe I'm too idealistic, I don't know, but I believe. There is a group of people out there that share that because they're doing it already. All mm -hmm. I've done is codified it in my own way and say, well, this is how I explain it. And there's some science and there's some stuff that sits behind it that kind of says this kind of feels right. <laughs> if if you believe it's right and you, you think it's useful and it's helpful and it, it's got some practical things to help you forward, then, then why wouldn't you try it? Why not? And then why not adapt it to you? Because what I'm not saying is mm. you must do this and you must do that. And you, if if self acceptance isn't you and slapping your hand in the mirror, looking at yourself, fine. Okay, find another way. What what is it for you? Mm. 
Well, I, I, I definitely will practice it tomorrow. Let's do things. Let's host them both first. Uh, take the whole family out to the grass, right? Because we, we're in the hotel at the moment. It's a very beautiful garden. So we take them out for 10 minutes and the, the, in the morning. Yes. Yeah. And, and sit up on the grass for 10 minutes and let them try to experience that one, the grounding. And the second thing is I will teach my, my three kids to touch the, and you know, the mirror every time awesome. they look at the mirror. Two, you know, have the acceptance of cells. You know, it's those two symbols to practice, but I don't know that, you know, we, we are so busy in life, busy. And then, <laughs> and then sometimes we forgot a lot of, you know, small things that are meaningful for us, right? So, uh, Paul, I really appreciate um, the time that you spend and all the wisdom that you share with us today. And I hope that you also enjoy, you know, as, you know, uh, the program bring you back from when you started, uh, you know, your university as yes, the finance and and uh, finance and economic, right? And then all the way to your consulting career and up until where you started your own firms now. And uh, really, really appreciate it, Paul. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, we still in the spirit of uh, Lunar New Year in Vietnam, so I would like to take this opportunity to say, hey, happy Lunar New Year to you and your loved ones. Happy New Year to you and too. <laughs> 